<laughs> I remember so many times being and taking advantage of the education that I was given in the Lord by being blessed to be in a steady environment at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa that literally was not about we're right and you're wrong but was more about hey look this is what the Holy Spirit is showing us and if you think the Holy Spirit is showing you something else and you want to go somewhere else and God is leading you that way then go you know I mean Chuck Smith gave to us a great heritage that we should be led by God to do what God is telling us to do, but also to let him teach us so that we could look and examine things. And I remember in my life time as a very, very intimidated Christian by everyone around me. I mean, now I discover I had probably, if we were counting it this way, which we don't, Phenomenal gifts of the Spirit that most people didn't have in those days, but I didn't know that. You know, I thought they all had everything, you know, because I was like, you know, thinking I was like the, the hangnail of God's body of Christ. <laughs> well, and I also had a handicap, and I was getting over my own self-image and all kinds of issues, you know, about being disabled and being one of those people that, you know, oh, no, you know, I'm not healed. <laughs> Go figure. Oh, boy some of the misconceptions that people have. But the one thing I remember dramatically, oh, I was so thrilled about, I had spent all this time in the Word, I was studying the Scripture, and one night God just went and started talking to me, you know. Of course, I figured everybody was the same as me, and God spoke to everybody, and I found out, no, they didn't really think He would, so they didn't try. Anyways, so I was... I had just gotten my strongest concordance, you know, and I was kind of like, I did my first word study on, like, eternity and proved to myself that eternity meant ages to ages, so that way, somewhere down in eternity, I wouldn't be wiped out, but ages to ages to ages life, I could keep living. Whew. Eliminated that problem. Of course, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, and you probably think eternity means, like, you know, forever, and really, <laughs> oh well, you'll figure it out. But I was doing this study on, uh, at the time, we were, you know, all all, every one of us, that really, that were there at the time, we were all, like, really scholars on end times prophecy. You know, we had Chuck Missler was teaching on Monday night, you know, and we had Chuck Smith teaching on Sunday night, and, you know, we had Romaine on Thursday, and keep it balanced. We had, boy, Wednesday night Bible studies, I mean, Rick Boyer was running around, uh, John Corson was around, I mean, everybody was around. I mean, you could suck it all in and get become a sage <laughs> but I did so anyways one night after Sunday night service Chuck used to stand in the back and you know, people come up and talk to him or he'd stand in front I mean people would line up and talk to him now that I think about it it was the line going forward and uh, I remember you know I was terrified I was scared out of my mind but I'd been studying for these, this thing for weeks on Ezekiel 4220 and so Everyone had been saying, you know, I even went to a Chuck Nesser study, you know, and was trying to get to talk to him, didn't get a chance to. And, yeah, he just finished on it, and I was trying to get over to John, but John had to go back somewhere, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him. So I really didn't get a chance to talk to anybody, so the last one left was Chuck Smith. So I had been studying this Ezekiel 42.20, where it said that, that there would be a separation between the holy and profane, and everybody was writing these books, and all these prophecy scholars, a lot of them still around today, <laughs> We're writing books and telling stories about, oh, the temple's got to be destroyed first. That it's going to be built right on top of. And I was like, when I first heard it, I said, nah. So then I went into a study on it. And I was pulling all these scriptures out of the Old Testament, pulling all this out of the New Testament, looking at Revelation and trying to coordinate it and getting all the countries lined out and getting all the prophecies lined out, the scriptures and putting them all to pieces and getting it all straightened out in my mind so I could present it to Chuck Smith, you know, because I wanted to. I want validation. So, you know, I'm going, and I lined out and drew out, you know, Ezekiel's temple, and I drew out, you know, what 
Millennial Temple and drew out all these things, you know, and lined them all out and took all the things that I knew about Jerusalem. I hadn't been there yet. Hadn't lived in Jerusalem yet either. <laughs> but anyways, had it all lined out and I was, I think I was only like 23, <laughs> maybe, maybe 24. <laughs> but I was timid and shy. But so, like a little squeak mouse, church mouse, I'm kind of going up there and I'm standing in line. I'm kind of like, I got my Bible and I'm clinging to it. <laughs> You know, shaking. And I'm thinking, Ezekiel 42.20 says that there should be a separation between the holy and profane. And so, I'm like, rehearsing my mind, what am I going to say, what am I going to say, what am I going to say, you know, blah, blah, blah. and then Chuck's getting bigger and bigger. Now, I'm not a Chuck guy, and I never worshipped Chuck when I was there, while I was there, and studying, and we all love Chuck, but, you know, it doesn't like he was a genius or anything. We just enjoy the fact that you felt like he had just come down from the mountaintop like Moses and he's talking to us what him and God had talked about. And it was fun. You know? Now those that know Chuck, you know, kinda also knew that it was, you know, could be human too, you know. <laughs> Believe me, if you ever saw Chuck give a look up at the sound booth, I was sitting up there once. I know what that look means. <laughs> Ooh <laughs> scary. Anyways, but I'm walking up and I'm getting ready to talk to Chuck. And then the last guy moves out of the way. And I'm like, there's Chuck Smith, and he goes, and he's got this just little, you know, glow after stack. Whenever you're studying, whenever you share something for the word, you got this glow because it's really not you. It's just the Lord, the Holy Spirit was using you, so you got a glow. Anyways, so he just kind of glow and smiling, and I said, then I open up my Bible, and then he's even seemed like he glowed a little more because it seemed like you know he always liked it when you open up your Bible. <laughs> he even told people open up your Bible. So I opened up my Bible. I said, you know, Chuck, I said Ezekiel forty-two twenty. He stopped, you know. I mean, I, he didn't really say anything, but he just kind of started to open up his Bible. So I waited. He opened up his Bible, was looking at it. He looked down, you know, and, and I was dumbfounded, so I was kind of like shell shocked. And I said, "Well, in Ezekiel forty-two twenty, I said, there, there, it says there that, and I've read it, there would be a separation to the point. Doesn't that, doesn't that mean to you that there would be a wall built, you know, separate that the temple?" could be built next to the profane place and that the profane place could be the Dome of the Rock and it could be separate, you know, from each other and they both could coexist. And I'll never forget him sitting there reading it, you know, just not hurrying, no hurry on the man's face at all, no perplexed look, no angst, no attitude. And he's just looking at it, and he's still smiling. He's looking down, and he's, you could tell his eyes were moving back and forth, you know, you, you, pupils, and he's reading it, and kind of reading the top, you know, reading it in, in context, I guess. And, and he looked up at me, he says, looks like that. He says, I'll have to study that. And I, I went, huh? And I was like, I wanted to, I wanted to hug him. <laughs> yeah, I should have, but I didn't. But I was like, Oh, I'm right. No, it wasn't like I was right, but it was like he just acknowledged that it could be. And that's all it took for me from that moment on. I was gone, you know, as far as any of you, no offense to you, if you're if you're a Bible scholar, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't think so. But, you know, the Holy Spirit is, so I kind of go with that more than you. But, you know, I mean, I've always enjoyed, you know, Bible scholars, Bible teachers, everybody else, even after that moment. But man, when Chuck Smith just kind of shared that, that it could be, I was gone. I knew, and after that, the Holy Spirit showed me all these different teachings when we were going through them, when the Holy Spirit, you know, God was using Chuck to tell us that, you know, God could lead us in different directions for different purposes and different designs because of diverse works of how His grace works and how His mercy works and how He can be sending people out to do this and do that and do wherever, you know. Just as long as you're studying the Word and you're walking with God and you know God and God's in you and He's working through you and the Holy Spirit's there, you know, you got it all covered. So I was like on fire. So I turned around and walked away <laughs> and spent the entire night thrilled telling everyone I could I could think of about my new new revelation. And you know what? It took about two years later before Chuck got to Ezekiel forty two twenty. And I have the tape where he said, It looks like the temple doesn't have to be destroyed. And when I heard that, I cried. I wept. I was 
ハンドルする。And at that moment, my heart was woven into the fabric and the tapestry of the entire body of Christ, into the church as a whole. From then on, I knew with all my heart that I could never, never divide up what God has unified. I could never cast out what God has brought in. I could never separate myself ever from those who are called by Jesus' name. Because in the reality of that, I knew in that moment of time that there were others too whom the Holy Spirit had shared the same truth and that they would come to the same realization given time of what I had learned. Of course now, 30 years later, Most people kind of assume, and most scholars already teach, that there would be probably built next to the Dome of the Rock. Some of them still get this idea of an earthquake, you know, knocking it down, or some battle happening and it getting blown up, whatever. Irregardless of that, the point being is I knew that there will be a walled separation. And that it didn't have to be the way the scholars were saying. And so I was able to see how the Holy Spirit can take the foolish things of the world and the most humble and shy and terrified of men, whom I was, and share a truth with, at the time, what seemed to be a great man of God, whom I still consider a great man of God. But I consider all men great men of God as God uses them. <laughs> but God can use anyone, anytime, anywhere, any place. But He chooses, not when we do. So it wasn't anything special about me. It really wasn't. It wasn't anything special about Chuck Smith, except God uses him. It wasn't the fact that it was time for that to be unveiled, or that you know that could be the application of it, you know, and the fulfillment of it. And later I talked to Missler about it. And, you know, <laughs> with Missler, you always get kind of a, it's interesting, you know? <laughs> and then you get all this other stuff, you know, and then you go do research on that, and he gives you all this other stuff, you do research on that, and then, you know, you come back and you, you throw things at him, and he's got extra stuff, and you got extra stuff that you're smart, you know? And you, once in a while, maybe in a blue moon, you might catch him off guard. <laughs> maybe now that he's older, maybe he's off on distraction, but I don't know. In those days, that guy was sharp as a whip. <laughs> oh, boy. But you know, if it hadn't been for the Holy Spirit revealing that to me, I never would have known. And had I not gone there and shared that, I never would have been prepared for what I see in, in the world today. It's like even sharing that now with you. I am so renewed in my faith after being so discouraged after reading tabloid Christianity, shock jock prophecies, blasphemous um, statements by Christians saying things about the end of the world and fear mongering and all this horrendous stuff that they call eschatology nowadays and posted for people to feed on as though they were like maggots trying to chew up the last ecstasy of feeling of sensationalism that they get from all these exaggerations of what's happening in the world or what, what the Bible says. And they don't go after the purity of what God means and the reality of what God is doing when he wants to reveal himself in the midst of revelation. They go after the effects and not the person. Because prophecy is always about Jesus and Him being revealed. And so I was so discouraged, so I shared with you now about my memory of how God prepared me for these times. And I wanted to come out and I was talking to God as I walked out here you know, already started the recording and I have a few seconds to get out, that I wanted to tell you that I really don't know that I'm ready for 2012, you know, because I see so many 
political pieces, waste of time. So many lies said about scriptures that I, I felt wearied and burdened. I felt cast down. I felt overwhelmed. I felt burdened down that I could not lift my spirits to come out and share the word of God that God was giving in Tozer that I'd already shared earlier and I was so full of joy when I shared it the first time that I didn't record <laughs> by accident that I came out here and I wanted to just share the sadness and the sorrow and yet as I was revived in my heart of how God by His Holy Spirit can take these things and make them good I'm reminded now that as I look at the devotional even as we share it spiritual priority the missionary obligation I'm reminded of the time that I went to Jerusalem and I lived there and the times of my first few months I lived there 14 months but the first few months that I got there I didn't have support from the church I didn't have all these monies coming in as a matter of fact I didn't have anybody supporting me you know, except Tate Blending Library that my mother you know, took over and I gave to her and she started and it's a free one and, you know she would send me I don't know five bucks every so often <laughs> yeah really a lot of money for a missionary but uh I was made a missionary at large, you know, by, by uh, the church. And so when I went to Jerusalem, you know, I found <laughs> the church there in, indeed. So I was able to help them, but they didn't have any money. You know, <laughs> nobody had any money. And so I'm broke and impoverished and struggling, but at the same time, joyful and excited, but then terrified and fearful and all those things wrapped up together. That's what a missionary really is, you know, and then overcoming every minute of every hour you know by faith and the next minute you know trial and tribulation because if you live in Jerusalem it's compressed Jude, Jerusalem is like a city compacted together you know it really is there's there's demonic activity trust me there's religious activity huge there's atheism mega there's all kinds of junk going on all at the same time in the city of God and it is there I mean, it is, it emanates, it radiates, it is a principality, it is a power, it is a deception, it is a lie, it is a fact that where they crucified Jesus is the literal place where God and man, you know, have come to union in the knowledge that this is probably the place where Jacob's ladder went up and, or nearby and that you know, demonic activity as well as oppression and spiritual realities all come into conflicts and conflict there in that city, especially the old city. But anyways, and I lived in Rahavi, so <laughs> I'm right there. <laughs> Actually, at first I lived in the uh, Petra Hostel, I think for six months, approximately, maybe, long, maybe, maybe eight months. I was in the Petra Hostel, which is right there smack dab in the old city and I lived on the roof and you could look out over the entire city beautiful man I had eyewitness view of everything man it was great I was in my tent that's why they call me a Jesus Gypsy <laughs> but in remembering that too as I read the missionary obligation so many of the miracles and so many of the ways that God provides for a missionary are phenomenal I mean, I know now there's temporary missions and now they make it a little more easier for some people to go. But a real missionary, when they go out like Paul did or Barnabas did, when you have to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, you'll find so much going on. Miraculous and amazing that you know, even as I'm saying to you that I don't know that I could handle the onslaught of 2012. <laughs> Piece of cake. Yeah, me and God, we got it covered. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Stinking thinking without realizing, hey, of course I can't. But man, when the Holy Spirit lights up, when he takes over, when he speaks, when he walks, when he talks, when he decides to reveal, woohoo, it's exciting. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 1 8. 
The popular notion that the first obligation of the Christian church is to spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth is false. It's not true. It's putting the cart before the horse. Her first obligation is to be spiritually worthy to spread the gospel. Our Lord said, go ye, but he also said, carry ye. And the tarrying had to come before the going. Had the disciples gone forth as missionaries before the day of Pentecost, it would have been an overwhelming spiritual disaster, for they could not have done more than make converts after their own likenesses, and this would have altered for the worse the whole history of the Western world and consequences throughout the ages to come. Do you find people doing that? Do you see in your life today people making many images of themselves? You know, like, oh, I don't know, pick someone some big name pastor even, or some well-known ministry, and see if they're making many images of the same cookie, or are they giving the freedom to the Holy Spirit to allow that person in their own personality to go forth as they are, the way they are, who they are. For you see, when we look at the book of Acts, Peter is not Paul, and Paul is not Barnabas. And even Paul and Barnabas got into conflict at some point in time because Barnabas was trying to tell Paul to be Barnabas. And Paul was trying to tell Barnabas, I ain't doing your job. <laughs> no offense, but you know what? I'm doing my job. And so Mark got caught in the middle and eventually wound up sticking it out with Barnabas. And Mark is not Paul and Mark is definitely not Barnabas. So we see personality as well as purpose being accomplished by the Holy Spirit using them each and every severally differently and not creating men liking them to themselves. Because even Paul warned, don't say I'm of Apollos or I'm of Paul, but rather say I have Jesus in me. And sadly, I think mostly when you see a lot of people sitting too long in a pew, too long in a church, too long under the tutelage of one master, then they become likened unto that person. Unless the Holy Spirit is there, when the Holy Spirit forces them out to go into the uttermost parts of the world and become who they are meant to be. Chuck Smith often said that you learn ministry by doing ministry. You don't learn ministry by waiting to do ministry. You go and do. And I believe that's true, and he meant, I think, up to a point you learn, then go. You know, like you need a little bit of schooling, then go. You know, like maybe go through the Bible once, having read it once, you know, or listen to his tapes once, do. You know. But after that, then go out in ministry, go do. You don't need all these other, you know, theological titles. You don't need a license. You don't need a reference. You know, you don't need to go to Bible school. You don't need to go to seminary. You know, Chuck was very adamant about that. The Holy Spirit has called you and told you to go. You go. And he gives you the knowledge that you need at the time. And you will learn the ministry as you go, as Chuck did, until the time that he was prepared for the bigger ministry and the greater ministry that he wound up accomplishing through God doing it in him to become the Jesus movement as well as Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and the Calvary Chapel movement, which almost is a denomination now. But theoretically, the seed, being the word of God, should produce the same kind of fruit regardless of the spiritual condition of those who scatter it, in theory. But it does not work that way. You see, the identical message preached to the heathen by men of differing degrees of godliness will produce different kinds of converts and result in a quality of Christianity varying according to the purity and power of those who preach it. You can tell that today. You can look at somebody who's really into, let's say, Joel Osteen and they have a certain way of looking at things. And then you go to Trinity Broadcasting Network and see somebody that's been converted there, and they definitely have a certain way of looking at things. And then you go to somebody that, say, is very, oh, faith-oriented, and they believe in everyone's healed, you know, that the word of this and the word of that, by golly, they're going to get it, you know, and they definitely have a different way of looking at it. So the seed the Word of God that is in that person, that's being communicated to the people that are following that person, produces people of like mind. They are the same as the person that they're following. So, in that degree, we see what you want to accomplish. 
If you want to minister to the body of Christ, then see if that ministry ministers to the entire body of Christ or if it's trying to make disciples unto itself. Because in reality, God wants us to be what he wants us to be. If you are called to be a toe, be a toe and stick with toe, toe teachers. If you want to be a finger, and God's told you to be a finger, stick with finger teachers. If you want to be a heart, be heart teachers. But recognize that you are in the woof and the weave, in the tapestry that God has created of the bride, part of the body of Christ. I like to say it this way. You know, I may not be, you know, whacked out into one area of Pentecostalism, and I may not be antagonistic completely to a whole area of denominationalism, but you know what? In the fulfillment of the two, I see a beautiful blend. <laughs> one that is very structured is like a cup, you know? There, that's, that cup better keep its structure. It better stay very much a cup. And then these people over here who are very soluble, like seem to just like, you know, slosh around, they're what goes in the cup, you know? So when you put them in the cup, then you have a perfect blend. In other words, the structure of the denominational person fits the unstructured sloppiness of the soluble person over here. I like the analogy. God works with me on it. I minister to everyone. <laughs> if you tell me you know Jesus, I'll leave you alone. If you don't know Jesus, I'll say, well, you should know Jesus. Should. I don't say have to. I say you should because that's what Jesus said. He didn't make it mandatory. He said you should. Lots of times you should. Try that for a word study. That will blow your mind if you look up should every time he said it. Christianity will produce after its kind. A worldly-minded, unspiritual church, when she crosses the ocean to give her witness to people of other tongues and cultures, is sure to bring forth on other shores a Christianity much like her own. Everyone likes to point the finger and blame the old structured church for things we see now of what they did wrong. But not many people often give credit to the things that were right that they often did right. And the fact that we have a Bible in our hands means that something had to have been accomplished through the structure that God ordained to come forth out of the early days of the early church. Otherwise, you would not have a Bible in your hands. So I thank God for my rich heritage, my history in the church, as well as the bride that is coming out of all the churches, for there is no one church that is perfect, but the entire body of Christ, as it is meshed and melded together in love, as it learns grace and mercy and truth, becomes the bride. Notice that the body of Christ, as it becomes by way of grace, mercy and love, the bride then is ready to be taken home but what part of the body of Christ is the bride? That you can find literally in the book of Revelation in the letters to the seven churches. But the point being is this, it has always been about love. And just like when they do the little heart, it's always meant to be meshed together and found one, all of us jointly fit together, working to share the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts for those who are unsaved and those that are saved that we might bring unto God sons and daughters to him that he would accept and love with a pure heart and a holy content that says unto them come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world for when I was hungry you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. Enter in. And all the other things that Jesus said. So, when you think you have to do something, or you have to get ready, try to lend an ear to the Holy Spirit in some way, whatever you may do, 
if you're really into tongues, pray in tongues, and if you think you know what you're saying, and you know, if you'd understand what you're saying, then say it, you know, and if you're blessed and you understand what you're gonna do. But you know on that subject, no offense, you know, sure I like to pray in tongues. I also like to talk, you know, I also like to listen. I also like to be in the presence of God. And let me put this this way. For people that think there's an angelic tongue when you get in the presence of God, I, I, I got news for you, you know, that ain't it. You may be talking to angels or something, but you know what? When you get in the presence of God, you listen, you don't talk. <laughs> you move away and you talk to the angel about what's happening. But you don't talk to God direct, you know. He talks to you direct. And then if he says, come on, you know, then you talk to him. Though we have access boldly to the throne of grace, we are so undone by the love and overwhelming presence that he has. We are as though men who cannot speak, but rather what we see, what we feel, and what we handle with our own hands. Words cannot describe. And yet one day we'll be.